The same thing, by the way, the same principle was um, attempted recently in a conference on energy conservation. And you know that uh, meat is much more energy consuming than uh, vegetarian dishes. Um, so usually they would have this uh, paper that says, what do you want for lunch, meat or vegetarian? And people would choose what they want, and about 90% of the people chose the meat dish. Uh, last year, in, 2000, in the end of 2009, they changed the default, a little bit like the catheter. They said, we're giving you the vegetarian dish. If you want to switch it, go ahead. What happened now? 90% of the people chose the vegetarian. But, but it turns out meat is a really big, big issue, and if you can even small, in small ways get people to change their diets, this was one way, you can make a dramatic impact. So, you know, I, I think that if you think about what's the conclusion, the conclusion is we're not designed to deal with this problem. We need help. So we need to think for substitutes. How do we get ourselves to deal with it, given that it's so hard? So one thing is reward substitution. One thing is to get us to think about it, not all the time, but at crucial moment. Another one is to change regulation. Another one is to change small things in the environment, like defaults, that would get us to, to change our behavior, not even thinking about it, in, in a, in, to, to a better way. So, you know, what, what do we do in the retail? In the retail space is complex, because how do we deal with competition and so on? But I think to the extent that we can think about uh, defaults, any low emission default that we can enter, I think we should try and do things this way. That should be, that should be kind of the starting point. The starting point should be that, and then we could deviate from that if needed. Well, you know, for companies it's very tricky because uh, companies uh, don't necessarily think long-term as well. I mean, we think that people don't think long-term. Companies also don't think long-term. In fact, companies are more short-term than people. Uh, you know, Wall Street rewards companies every quarter. Right? It's not even every birthday. It's really, it's really short-term. And a CEO of a company will definitely not live as long as a person would live. And, um, so companies have a, a huge problem, problem with it. And the question is, how do companies get to care when they're not designed to care. So uh, recently I met the, the guy who runs Timberland, Jeff Schwartz, and um, I moderated a session in the World Economic Forum on, on environmentalism. And different people from different companies stood up and said what they're doing and how effective it is and also financially rewarding. And Jeff stood up and said, I'm sorry, but in Timberland, we can't find a financial reason to do what we're doing. Now, they're a great company. They're off the grid, they're almost 100% recycling. I mean, it's an amazing company in terms of what they're doing. But he said that they can't find a financial reason to do that. But he also said he doesn't care. He said the reason he's doing it is not for financial profit. He's doing it because he thinks this is the right way to lead companies and the, the world that he wants to leave to his kids. Now, that's not a typical mindset for companies, but in some sense, it's the mindset we all want for companies to have. So how do we get them to do it? One way is through regulation. Another one could be through consumer demand or even employee demand. So for example, imagine that together with companies' financial statements every quarter, they would have to make a statement about how much pollution they have been uh, putting to the world and how to emission. Or imagine that uh, much like you, you see a nutritional content of each food, every time you buy a product, you would see how much... A sustainable index. Yeah, some sustainable index, some, some pollution index, and so on. All of those things would bring those unobservable. To care is a starting point we need to be able to observe, and then there might become some pressure to do it, both within the company and outside the company. So, so I don't think that people would look at a, a product that, that has a lot of CO2 emissions and say, I don't want that product. I don't think it would be that direct. I mean, there are some people who really care, so for them it would be a big issue. Um, but for most issue, it w most people would kind of penetrate their thinking. But, but it's okay if it penetrates their thinking slowly, slowly. And if companies think it penetrates people's attention, that's good too. I mean, in some sense, when you're measuring something, you also want to create pressure within the company. So imagine I'm in charge of some production line, and I see my CO2 emission all of a sudden. I might spend some time thinking about how I could cut it down. Why wouldn't I? I might be willing to spend some money to do it, right? So the moment you make something measurable, people start caring just by the fact that it's measurable. So 
um, even if the consumer would not care, the people in the company might care. And, and that could create, you know, people take lots of pride in their job. If I work in a company that produces lots of uh, carbon footprint, I might not be as happy. I must try to do my share to cut it down. So one thing is to, uh, you need to give people a measurement to understand what they're doing. And so right now, if you ask most people who work in different companies and they're facing different decision paths, what will those different decision paths mean in terms of carbon emission? They have no idea. They have no idea. So, so we need to measure and we need to start connecting pride to it. Right? And those, I think, are the two big, two big issues. So, you know, outside of things that are outside of our mind, regulation and kind of so on, um, I want to give you options that show you what the consequences are. What happens when you buy coffee this way versus coffee this way? What are the consequences? And, and you might not care too much, but one day you might care, you might have a discussion with something, and you might start using a different option, and that will become a habit for you. So, you know, the, the whole perspective of behavioral economics is we're not going to solve this problem. There's not going to be one solution, because there's one way to be rational, and there are many ways to be irrational. And instead, what we need to do is we need to try multiple things. We, need to, we can't afford not to. We need to try a lot of different tracks and try and change people's behavior in many different approaches. For example, three years ago, we had here in Durham water problem. So we in the school where my kids go, we try to get the kids to pressure their parents to save water. Okay? Kids are, you know, lots of pressure from your kids changes people to a big degree. It's not the ultimate solution, it's not the only one, but if you think about the suite of solutions, that's one of them. So one, one of the challenges is what's good? Imagine you have two products and one of them says the production was eight cubic ton of CO2 emission and one was seven and a half. Well, how, how do you make a decision about that? So seven and a half is less than eight, but how much less than eight and what's, and what's good? So in some experiments recently about energy bills, they basically gave people their energy bills back and showed them also how much their neighbors were using. And they thought that would help people kind of think about what, how they're standing compared to their neighbors. But what turns out is that it wasn't as helpful as when they put a little face on it with either a sad face or a smiley face. Because a smiley face is kind of, it tells you good or bad. So when I say eight cubic ton, it's very, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exact number, but not very, very informative. So for example, recently in New York, they added uh, calorie labeling to food. So in McDonald's, you go in New York City, you know exactly how much calories each thing you're eating had no effect on consumption. In fact, it looks like people are eating slightly more fatty food now because of that. It's because when I say it's 1,400 calories, you don't really understand what it is. Right? So we need to think about when we present this information to people, what can people easily process, understand, comprehend, make sense of, and, and so on. So that's, that's kind of a crucial element.